let's talk about sustainable forestry. Man, look at that picture. Doesn't don't you just wish you were there? Oh. Okay. So what do we mean by sustainable forestry? Basically, sustainable forestry, remember, uh, sustainable, think of it like renewable, okay? So it, it, non-renewable would be unsustainable, right? You, you can, you know, you run out of it, right? A sustainable forestry means managing forests in a way that you can have them forever uh, and still get some economic benefit out of them, right? So the idea is it's a way of managing a forest ecosystem in such a way that you can get economic uh, use out of the land, you know, uh, you can cut trees and you can, you know, take animals, whatever. Uh, but you're not destroying the ecosystem. It can, it can continue to go on and take care of itself. So basically all those, those different, uh, ecosystem services like provisioning, you know, and we can hunt, we can harvest trees, we can fish, the regulating, you know, it's taking carbon dioxide out of the air. It's, uh, it's, uh, filtering the water for us. It's, it's providing habitat for animals. So there's the sporting services. It's, it's beautiful. We want to walk around in it. So it's got the, the cultural service. So it, it can do all these things at once. That's the goal of sustainable forestry. Now there's some controversy as to whether or not, uh, it's, it's completely achievable, but we'll deal with that. Okay. So let's start with this. <clears throat> humans are humans. Remember, it's in our DNA to be selfish, to look after our own needs first, or to try to make our own profits the highest. So basically, tragedy, the common behaviors, those definitely play into forestry. So what happens is uh, when, when we have shared resources, when we don't feel ownership of them, then we have a tendency to destroy the resources. So, so without regulations, uh, what we find is uh, that 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 people just just exploit and exploit. They uh, over harvest, they destroy forests, and then you end up with all these problems. We talked about the clear flooding, clear cutting, you end up de deforestation. Basically, what you need is you need to have you know enforceable regulations, and you need to have some sort of economic incentives for people to maintain a forest in in a way that is sustainable. Now, there's a couple of terms we need to deal with. One of them is called deforestation. So deforestation is what it sounds like. It means like getting rid of forests. Well, it turns out in developing countries and developed countries, there's generally different reasons why it happens. So in developed countries like Korea, I see this a bit. I see this a lot in the United States, especially in the state I come from, is that the main reason for deforestation has to do with, with developing land for housing and urban development. So people clear out forests and they just move in houses. You know, in the, in the, in the place where my house is in Silver Dale, Washington, you know, it, it's beautiful old forest, right? And these people come in and they'll just clear out the forest, put in houses. And now all of a sudden like bears will be walking across my street. And it's because they used to live in that forest and they can't anymore because they cut it down. So, so <clears throat> that's one example of uh, deforestation in a developed country. <clears throat> in developing countries, uh, poor countries, like in, in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, and maybe in Brazil, <clears throat> what you have is uh, the main reason for deforestation is to convert the land to small scale subsistence farming. So, you know, you have five kids, there's not enough room on your land for them all to, to have their own family. So they need to have a farm. So what do they do? They cut down forests and they make a farm out of it. And so as the human population grows, the population of the forest decreases because people are clearing out land just to make, make a, a space to grow food for themselves. Now, unfortunately, one way of doing this is particularly destructive, and you see this a lot in uh, Amazonia, and it's called slash and burn agriculture. So basically, if you recall, rainforests have very low nutrient levels in the soil because uh, most of the nutrients that comes down from the trees gets taken up by decomposing organisms, uh, and it gets cycled without actually getting to the soil. And what does get in the soil tends to get leached out by the heavy rain. So in other words, the soils are very poor in nutrients. So if you just you know, clear out forests and plant, nothing happens. The, the, the ground just can't, it doesn't have enough nutrients, no, not enough phosphorus or nitrogen to, to help your crops grow. So what people do is they, they burn the forest and then that takes all the nutrients, all the, the, the nitrogen and the, the, the phosphorus that's in the trees, puts it in the soil. And this is great for a little while, but you know, it doesn't take very long before afterwards you find that the soil just doesn't support uh, plant growth anymore. And unfortunately, what's happened is you've, you've, you've broken the cycle that had been established over millions of years. And now it's really, really difficult for the soil to ever establish another rainforest. And so it's not like the forest just grows right back like it would in, a, say, a, a deciduous temperate area. In this case, the soils are so low in nutrients, it's really, really difficult for secondary succession to happen in these rainforest environments because of the lack of nutrients in the soil. 
clear cutting, and that happens in both developing countries and developed countries. And one thing I will say about developing countries too is is they're more likely to export natural resources than developed countries are. So you have you'll have countries uh, that have forests. And they'll see those forests as just uh, you know a company, a, a kind of corrupt company will you know you know make the right bribes, and they'll just they'll just totally devastate the forest and just ship those logs off for a, a, a profit. But you know they, they they could harvest a lot less if they kept it locally and provided jobs for people uh, in a sustainable way. But that tends not to happen. So clear cutting tends to happen instead. So clear cutting again. Uh, it, it it causes soil degradation because of reasons we talked about the other day. Now, so let's talk about sustainable forestry. So sustainable forestry would be, well, you know what, instead of instead of slash and burn, instead of clear cutting, what if we did selective cutting? What if we just chose the trees we want to cut and left the other ones in place so that the forest habitat still has the nutrient cycling, it still has shade to protect the soils? It's it's a much more sustainable method. So so you'll have basically mixed age trees. They won't all be the same age, but they'll be they'll be enough that you can harvest in an ongoing way. That's the idea of sustained forestry. Whoops. Now, we'll just talk about the United States because as I said, this this, this test you're gonna be taking is very Americentric. Just talk about the United States and how they've dealt with forests. Okay? And they're blessed with having large, large, large tracts of forest. So beginning in the 1800s, the United States government started setting aside large areas, starting with the Abraham Lincoln, just large areas of land and said, look, we're just gonna leave this as, as forest land uh, and, and not let people develop into the farms. And so you end up with what's called the National Park System and the National Forest System. And they're slightly different in their, in their um, reasons for being. So the National Park System, its job is to set aside these national parks. And these parks are, are basically, we're trying to preserve a natural environment, a natural ecosystem. And so we don't allow mining, we don't allow logging, hunting, any of that. It's just we're preserving nature, but we're also encouraging people to go. We're making it possible for people to go in and observe these things because it helps people value uh, the natural environment. It's just good for people as a, as a, a, a cultural ecosystem service. Uh, now, natu national forest system is different. National forest system is saying, well, these forests are a commodity and uh, we can use them for economic advantage. So we allow logging, we allow mining, we allow hunting and grazing. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, we also try to to regulate them in such a way that they're sustainable so that they're there for future generations as well. That we don't want to just be like a one-time use. We just don't want to go there and clear cut everything. Although, you know, unfortunately, you know, sometimes companies are able to 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 get a break and do stuff like that. But there's always this at least at least you have a an, an oversight uh, whose mission is to try to allow sustainable forestry practices so that uh, the forest is there for future generations to have economic and cultural benefits from. All right, now let's talk about fires because obviously a fire d can destroy whole huge amounts of forest and it's, it's a growing problem. And I would be shocked. There's two things I would bet is going to end up on your test this year. I bet something about viral spread because of coronavirus, and that's something we cover in this class. Uh, virus is not coronavirus, and and fires because fires were a big issue in California this year, and they're have always been featured pretty heavily on the AP test. So let's just talk about them all right now. Okay, so. Forest fires are really the greatest threat to these nat national areas, be natural areas, because because you know a hot fire will just destroy everything, and then it can take a long time for secondary succession to bring it back. Now, <clears throat> and not only does it destroy the forest ecosystem, it also releases a lot of carbon dioxide back into the into the air. So, uh, you know. It, it, it's been estimated that up to 20% of the carbon dioxide increase that's occurring uh, in our atmosphere can be attributable to forest fires. And as you know, it's one of those, those um, unfortunately, you know, it's a, a positive feedback loop. You know, the more, the more it gets warmer, the more forest fires we have, the more carbon dioxide we put in. So, right, but anyway, so forest fires are, are an important issue. We need to talk about them. And they, like I said, they do come up quite a bit on the test. So <clears throat> let's start with this. There's three kinds of forest fires. Okay, who knew, right? There's surface fires, crown fires, and ground fires. And let's just look at each of them in turn. So a, a surface fire is one that's just burning the underbrush, the fallen limbs, the shrubs. Basically, there's not that much fuel there to get a super hot fire. So it just kind of moves through the forest, but it, it burns the underbrush, but it doesn't really catch the trunks on fire. So, so the trees might get a little bit blackened, but they don't die. And the tops of them, where all the growth is, are untouched. The crowns of the trees are untouched. 
and and this is a normal part of 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 a forest ecosystem you know fires are normal fires are natural they happen at a very regular but they're usually started by lightning and then what happens is it just burns through the forest it gets rid of all that fuel and, and it keeps the forest in a state and in fact you know there, there's some plants they need to have fires in order to propagate Crown fires are the ones we think of when we think of forest fires. Crown fires means it involves the top or the crowns of the trees. And usually in order for this to happen, there has to be a lot of dry fuel down below to, that, that makes a fire big enough to get up high enough up in the tree to catch the crowns on fire. <clears throat> and these ones are the ones that are very destructive. Crown fires end up just destroying huge, 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 multi, multi-hectare areas of land, uh, sometimes significant portions of a state. Uh, and they're very destructive, and this happened quite a bit this last year in California. Uh, so these are the ones where human intervention is often uh, very much needed in order to prevent their spread. And then there's another kind of fire. I don't know if it'll be on the test, but it's worth noting. It's called a ground fire. Really, it should be called an underground fire because what happens is there's certain places in swamps and bogs and places like that where uh, you have this material, this, this semi-decomposed plant matter that's that's underneath the, the, the ground level, and it's, it's fairly aerated, and, and fires can smolder in there. So it's not like big flames, but but there's constantly smoke coming out of it. And, and I mean, these things, they're almost impossible to put out because they're underground. I mean, you basically just have to wait until the seasons change and you get enough precipitation for them to go in. I've been in areas where they had them. It makes it almost impossible to breathe. It's terrible. And as I said, <clears throat> fires are totally natural. There have always been forest fires. Long, since, long before there was humans, there was forest fires. Uh, there, weren't any, there weren't any firemen to put them out. Okay, uh, and, and so, so there's a, a, a school of thought that says, look, this is natural. Lightning tends to start forest fires. Uh, and uh, basically, what happens is that that you know if they have that this happens fairly frequently, and it just you get these ground fires. You just burn up that 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 stuff on the ground, the shrubs and the fallen tree limbs. But you know what? You don't burn the whole forest down as a result of this. In fact, there's some things like lodgepole pines and eucalyptus trees. They're unable to to procreate. Their seeds don't open unless there's been a fire. And why? Well, because after a fire, there's there's less shading happening on the forest ground level because the shrubs are burned. So the, the 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 seedlings have a chance to to grow before the other things, other grasses and shrubs start to come in and out compete them. So it gives them a chance to grow ahead. So there are definitely some species that their seeds will land on the ground and just sit there sometimes for years until a fire comes along and then they'll pop open and start to grow. So, so it's, it's definitely evolution has taken fires into account. Now, um, sorry about that. Now, in order to preserve forest areas, and we just don't have that many of them, you know, we, we sometimes, especially when we have crown fires, we're going to deploy these wildland firefighters. And these people are just going to go in there, and they're really going to try to to keep the, the um, these these fires from erupting and, and, and consuming whole whole uh, ecosystems. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes they're able to do it, but a lot of times it gets out of control, and it, it, they really have to just sort of try to keep it in check until nature changes the, the weather from, from dry to wet. Okay. But now here's what's weird. Uh, even though we often deploy firefighters, we think of them as people who put out fires, they also start fires. And the reason they start fires is like, well, if it does, if we don't get lightning soon enough, well, what happens is we get too much buildup of this underbrush, this fuel that can then cause a crown fire. So they just go through and they actually light the fires themselves uh, when the conditions are such that they don't feel like it will erupt into a crown fire. So they will, they will do a, what's called a control burn. Uh, That's what nature is kind of designed for us for, but if it doesn't happen in time, we'll just make it happen. Uh, and that lets us uh, reduce the amount of fuel that's on the forest floor so that we're unlikely to have uh, crown fires. And we provide that opportunity for those plants that require fires in order to propagate. Now, here's the thing, though. There's a lot of debate about this in the environmental community because there are people who will say, look, uh, it's a natural part of an ecosystem. You just, you've got to let this happen. You just don't put out fires, let them happen. You know, this ecosystem evolved to handle this. So we don't have to intervene. There's other people say, well, you know, we've cut down so many forests, we don't have that many left. And so we can't, you know, we just can't let nature go and hope that it's going to take care of itself because what if it doesn't? What if it gets totally out of control? So, so you know, and plus two, there's economic considerations here. So maybe we ought to, you know, manage for us somehow, you know, take a, take a, a, 
a proactive stance in trying to to keep this forest from burning. And you know, there's arguments made both ways. So let's just look at these arguments, okay? Let's talk about the hands-off approach. Like people should just stay the heck away and let 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 forests do what they want to. Well, here's the argument for it, okay? Forests don't need us. They were here before we were. Uh, they can do it. So what happens is, uh, it it will happen on its own naturally enough. It doesn't usually get out of hand. And then what happens is that uh, if you do let people go in, you're going to end up just allowing them to to steal trees they should be stealing, to, to, to scare animals out of there. You're just going to disrupt too much. The act of trying to manage a forest is too disruptive to the forest, less disruptive than allowing natural fires to happen. That's the argument for. Well, the argument against doing a hands-off approach is, well, if you don't clear out diseased and dying trees that are drying out if you if you don't clear out the stuff on the floor too much fuel will build up and then when you get a fire it will become a crown fire and you'll lose all of this you know and, you know and the, the, it's bad for everybody including the economy and 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 a case in point is in 1988 uh yellowstone national park which is a real treasure of america you need to see this place it is amazing but uh they for a long time had this policy of hands off and what happened was they just had this bad season where it rained a lot early on, and so there was a lot of growth of new stuff, then it dried out, so there's just a lot of fuel, and this fire started, and they debated as to what to do about it and just got out of hand, and it was this huge fire. It burned like a third of the park. It, it, you know, They had to revise their, their thoughts about taking the hands-off approach after that. Now, the managed forest approach, here's their argument. They go, look, if we let timber companies come in and harvest those diseased trees, those trees that have been infected with beetles, or they're going to die, they're not good. We just cut those down, take them out, and sell them. Then they're not there to start the crown fires, all right? Uh, and, and it provides jobs, right? So we're, we're helping the forest, and we're helping the community people who live near there. We're giving them jobs. And you know what? There's a strong argument being made here. There really is, except that there's a good argument against this, which is that yeah, but you're trusting these companies to only cut down trees. Like, like who's going to make the decision on individual trees? So does that tree really need to be cut down, or are you just cut it down because you're going to make a lot of money? Yeah, you know, and so these large diameter trees are worth a lot of money, and we're like, wait a sec, I think you're cutting down too many of those. Uh, and not only that, when you move that equipment in to harvest these trees, that's very disruptive and damaging to other parts of the ecosystem. You know, apart from the trees. So I wish I could give you an easy answer. There really isn't one. The, the, the both sides have solid arguments here, both for and against on both sides. It's tough being a grown-up sometimes, isn't it? Now, one of the main things that makes forests susceptible to fires is diseases, and these are often caused by pests. So this is what you're seeing here is the devastation caused by the western uh, pine bark beetle. And basically, it uh, is devastated wide swaths of the western United States. And, and when, it, when it infects these trees, they slowly die off. And they have just these tall, dead trees that are just totally ripe for catching on fire. So it, it is a real problem. So so we do need, when this happens, to have some way of managing the forest. You know, we, we, you know, a sustainable forest practice needs to take into account what to do when you have the spread of a disease, in this case of an invasive organism. So, so they're going to employ a thing, and we'll, we'll have a separate uh, uh, video about this. Uh, but, but the Forest Service uses what they call integrated pest management, and it's its own topic. Uh, but basically, uh, uh, IPM is basically this this multi pronged approach to how to deal with pests. So, it's, you don't just do it one way; just don't go and spray a bunch of pesticides. Yeah, dump DDT on the forest. That's not what we do. So, you say, all right. <clears throat> What you, you do lots of different things to try to protect the forest in the most minimum, minim, minimally damaging way. So you do things like this. You you thin out those trees that are dead and dying, uh, and 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 you you put fertilizer down if you need to in areas where you feel like the the, the growth is being stymied. So you try to make sure the trees that you have are healthy. You, you take out those ones that are infected. You just you just remove them. Um, you monitor for pests. So you have programs in place where you, you can see, you, know, you put these traps where you can tell if you're getting uh, invasive organisms that are known to cause, like beetles or gypsy moths, whatever. So you, you have people whose job it is to put out traps and then monitor those traps. Uh, and if you find you, you're starting to get the wrong kind of organisms that might kill your trees, what you do is you, you say, well, let's want to release some predators. We know like these wasps will lay their eggs in these these caterpillars, so we'll release some of these wasp species or certain parasites that we know are going to kill the pests, but not not infect the other things in the forest. I mean, it's tricky, but you know, there's there's people who that's their job to figure these things out. Uh, another kind of new thing is using uh, genetics. So there's a thing called a gene drive. You can you can 
Uh, they've done this in Florida Everglades just recently. It's kind of controversial because, you know, genetic alterations of animals is still kind of something very controversial. But the idea is you can engineer, say we have gypsy moths, you can engineer gypsy moth, male gypsy moths, so that they're sterile. You know, they, they don't produce sperm cells, but they don't know that. So they just go out there and they mate and their mates think they're getting pregnant, but they're not. OK, and so uh, it, it, it is a way of uh, causing the population to go down because they're having unsuccessful matings. Another thing you can do is it's just the old good old traditional spray bug spray. Right. You, know, you could you can just spray not DDT, but some other kind of organophosphate, you know, kind of bug spray kind of stuff. And obviously they, they tend to be what are called broad spectrum. That means they're going to kill things you didn't mean to kill. So they don't like using them, but sometimes it's necessary if you've got a bad outbreak you need to deal with. Um, then you can have what are called biologic pesticides. And these are kind of interesting. They're used quite a bit. So the main one, and you should know this one, is called BT. Uh, and it's the name for some bacteria, I forget. But it's basically, it's the short for the genus and species name of this one. Soil bacteria that's normally found in the soils of the same ecosystem. So it's, it's not it's not something new there, but, but, but usually it's in the soil. And we just spray it. And it turns out uh, this bacteria is usually very harmful to the larval stages of many insect species. And so, and, and larval, st larval stages are often where most of the damage is being done. And so it kills them. So that's used. And another thing is that we can use what are called pheromone traps. So pheromones are chemicals that animals use to signal each other so for reproductive purposes. So you can put out pheromone traps are very common in American backyards. So, you know, wasps will go in thinking they're finding a mate because they smell it, but actually they're just going into a trap. So you can do large scale trapping. You can also put out enough of this pheromone that you're just confusing. And they're, and they're specific to, you know, that pheromone is specific to one particular organism. So no one else is going to smell it, but that organism, that organism, are going to smell and go, hey, I need a mate. And so you can put a lot of it out there and just like confuse the heck out of all these males and, and, and mating doesn't happen. So those that, that's what integrated pest management looks like. If you did not use integrated pest management, you would probably just all just go with traditional pesticides, just dump pesticides. And the whole idea of IPM is to try to get away from that. Let's use a multi multifaceted approach so that we can still achieve the same goals without doing as much damage. And again, we'll talk about it later. Now, I'm just thinking that the, the California wildfire season is a topic that might come, so I thought maybe we ought to talk about here. Okay, so let's just, why do we have the season that we had in California this year? And they're still having it, okay? So let's start with this. There's been a movement of people to leave a city and build communities and, and houses out in the woods, okay? So people are more likely to live where these fires are a problem, and people accidentally start fires sometimes, okay? So that's one thing. In fact, one of the ways that, that fires get started is not the people directly, but it's just people need electricity. And it turns out that PG&E, uh, Pacific Power and Gas, uh, pa Pacific Gas and Electric, they're responsible for most of these fires. Because what happens is their power lines, when, when the wind blows, uh, there's arcing that happens. And this arcing can get start trees on fire. So many of California's biggest fires have been started by accident, by power lines. Some of them have been started by people. You know, you probably heard like the what was that one like like announcing the gender their gender reveal parties or, or just you know being careless with campfires, but a lot of them are started by power lines. It's worth knowing. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the most dangerous conditions that happen are when you get a very wet spring, so you get a lot of new growth, and then it gets very dry, and that 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 new growth dries out. So you have a lot of fuel, right? There was a lot of productivity early on, and now I've got a lot of those those compounds just sitting there in those trees with a lot of energy in them. And that's when fire seasons take off. And that's what happened this year. Okay. So they had a wet, we had a wet winter and spring followed by a very dry summer. And that always makes, makes for a terrible fire season. Another thing that happens is what's called Santa Ana winds or catabatic winds. And so this is something we just talked about in our last, uh, you know, but let's just talk about this. So what happens is winds come out of the Sierra Mountain. So, so basically what you get is high pressure builds up in the middle of America and there's low pressure offshore. So remember, winds always move from high pressure to low pressure. So the air is being pushed over the Sierra Nevada Mountains and it comes down, you know, and it's starting at over 3,000 meters. And as it comes down the hillsides, it gets compressed. And as it gets compressed, it gets heated. Remember, that's why they have thermal inversions, subsidence inversions over L.A., but, but these winds can go quite fast, and, and, and what happens is it gets quite dry. And so you get these hot, dry winds that happen, and, and, and wind brings fresh oxygen, and it carries embers. So, so winds are always just terrible, right? Uh, and they definitely, that was definitely part of their fire season. Well, and I, I should just point out, too, uh, it's worth noting that, that global climate change and El Nino is definitely a part of this, right? So, so 
we know that both things happen, right? So we're having a, a hotter, it's the hottest year on record. So we shouldn't be surprised there's fires. And we're having a strong La Nina. And when there's a La Nina, you tend to get uh, drier than normal conditions in California, right? Wetter conditions out in, in like Australia and Southeast Asia. All right. Now let's just real quick. I'm sorry this one goes so long. As long as you're talking about fires, and this one I felt bad about at the very beginning of the year. I felt like maybe I should talk about it then, but it just seems to fit in. When we're talking about grassland biomes, it's worth noting that, that fires are a very important part. There's been many questions that the College Board has asked over the years about this, so I just want to squeeze this in right now. Fire, it turns out, is a really important natural component of the grassland biomes, as well as it is for more important than it is in forest biomes. All right, And here's why. <clears throat> so in a grassland biome, you know, there's not enough, there's not enough rain to support tree growth so say you have grass growth what happens is these grass die and then you just get this you know if, if several years goes by you get all this dead grass in here and 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 this dead grass does several things one is it holds a lot of nutrients in it it died but it's just sitting there and its nutrients are still in that dead that, that dead piece of grass right so it's, you basically took nutrients out of the soil but you haven't returned them all right uh, it also makes it hard if you're a little plant trying to grow down here, there's all this shade and without shade and you know, with all that shade and not enough light, you just can't get started. So it makes it hard for reproduction to happen. It also makes it harder for grazing animals who live in grasslands. You know, they, there's all these dead plants that they don't want. And so it's, it's hard for them to, to find the plants that they do want. So basically dead grasses are a bummer for the grasslands, right? Good news is fires take care of that. Uh, so when there's a grassland fire, it very rapidly spreads across and burns everything but it, there's there's not that much fuel so it doesn't do damage to the soil it doesn't kill things it doesn't kill like the the nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil anything like that which crown fires do okay uh and so what happens is afterwards there's this explosion of growth like the native americans they understood this the the the, the you know the apaches and the sioux the ones who lived out in the prairies they would they would they would start fires because they understood if there's a fire then afterwards there's gonna be all this new growth and guess what when there's all this new growth all the bison, they, they wanted the bison, so the bison show up more. So it's just, it's something that people have known about since prehistory. They understood uh, that, that these fires increase both productivity and biodiversity. By basically, you cycle those nutrients real quickly, you take away all the shade, uh, all these different organisms, many of which are adapted to fire conditions, suddenly comes sprouting up. Okay, so you know, and it's not just plants, you know, there'll be biodiversity of of mammals, birds, insects, everything. So these fires really do promote biodiversity of the grasslands. And then you have, and I promise we're about done now, okay? So then you've got uh, the other thing about, about grasslands, this has nothing to do with fires, but they definitely have asked about this on the test, so I thought I'd throw this in today. And that is uh, the role of grazing animals in grasslands, okay? So these grazing animals, uh, not only do they, uh, when they when they when they poop, they recycle a lot of these nutrients. Okay, so they're good at distributing nutrients across the grassland area. But the other thing they do is their hooves push down into the soil, and this helps in improve infiltration when it rains because remember grasslands don't get that much anyway. Uh, and so if it gets into the ground, it, it's less likely to evaporate. So that's important for the grassland biome and also too that that where that hoof goes in it breaks the soil open it makes it easier for seeds to get in and sprouting up so people have done studies where they see yeah where animals have stepped and sort of torn open the, the grass roots and exposed soil uh, that's an important part of growth in these biomes okay that was a lot i apologize uh, but i think all of these are topics that you're likely to see on the test in some form so thank you for listening